In this clip, I review a student's PHP Docker file and give them advice on how to improve it in the real world. So first up, we had Charles who posted his Docker file. There we go. And uh, let me let me pull up the green screen so we can see more of that. All right. So let's look at this Docker file, shall we? And of course, the reality is here is that once you get to real world files, everything gets messier, right? We all learn in courses like the ones I have and we learn from blog articles and documentation. And then once we get to the real world, it always seems to be harder than that. So uh, I'm always trying to add more of that complexity to courses, but it's a lot of work to get that into courses because you have to, it's very context, right? It's very much about your environment and your setup and your particular app. So I thought last night, hey, why don't we talk about this in the show tomorrow? So if you really like this, Give this a thumbs up. Tell me in chat or in the comments that you would like more of these, and we'll make this a regular thing. We'll actually review uh, more Docker files and Compose files and pull out some of the, the good gems there. All right, so first up is Charles. And it looks like he's coming from uh, his own account. He's got a PHP Apache image based on that, that name. I'm going to just assume that that's what that is. And it's got a date, and, you, and notice it's got a version and a date in the name there. So that's uh, pretty common. As you start to get to your own custom from images, you'll start to do things like version them or date them or use commit IDs in them. And that's a way to guarantee that you're using the exact same image, right? Again, here, you don't want to use latest in any real production setup. You can always use latest for playing around and testing. But when you go to real stuff, you're always going to want to use those real versions. Um, oh, that's Azure PHP image, Charles says. Okay, cool. Uh, and then he's got here an interesting setup that I've not seen before, and I think I know why you're doing it. So in this run line here, uh, you're doing an apt get update, and then you're saying if that doesn't, you're, do, you're giving an or in bash, which means if this doesn't succeed, do this. And so you're repeating it. So I'm, I'm guessing that maybe either you're on a network or someplace where you potentially have, a co it's a common issue to have apt get update problems, or maybe you've had some quirks in the past where it's randomly failed, and if you just did it a second time, it would work. That's what I'm guessing you're doing there. Um, and it's an effective solution to that problem, if that's what, you're, if that's, if that's what it's for. Uh, otherwise, I don't normally see this kind of setup. This normally um, is not what I would uh, see there. All right, next up, you export, and which is just a tiny little metadata change, so it's not going to take much. Oh, look at that. Charles says it, um, yeah, he says it's a Azure PHP image and he spoke to Microsoft Azure support and it fixes a bug. So very cool. I'm going to change that. Uh, let's see. Let's do this. Changing the, the fonts here so it looks a little easier. Yeah, that's a little better. Mm. Yeah, all right. Cool. Um, so here's an interesting thing. So you're download. So you're doing some downloads, and you're installing a, a package, which is normal, and you're also doing a bunch of apt get installs here. So unless this is something you're testing and you're just trying to figure out how this workflow works, there's lots of opportunity for for optimization, especially when it comes to size. And you also have a, a situation here where you could get yourself in a little bit of trouble. So Notice up here that we have a separate run line that's doing the apt-get update. So 
you don't have that line down here where you're doing all the install. So you've broken these all these steps out. Now, if you start going and looking at official images, you will notice that they never do this. They always put it all in one huge run line. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The biggest reason here is cache busting. So when you think about when you build an image, there's a cache and behind it. Now, if you're using something like Jenkins or a CI CD runner, and you have disabled caching, where it's always going to build every time from scratch without without caching, then um, this may not be that issue, that kind of issue. But it will certainly be an issue if you build locally or you build on any system more than once. And this is what's going to happen. The uh, the run line, let's say it's there, okay, and it never changes, right? So the first time you build this image, everything's fine. And let's say you build three days later. It's not, it's going to cache this line because this line didn't change. Remember, and on the, on, the, on the standard Docker build command, cache busting is when you've changed a line. And when you change that line, everything in that line is rerun and every line after it. And what happens here is if you have this run line up here and it never changes, but then you add, let's say, another package down here in the run line. Or maybe you uh, change the versions and you hard code your versions, which you should also be doing. You should hard code the versions of all these tools uh, and maybe not zip and unzip and curl, but uh, if your security team is strict, they will expect you to have reliable versions. And that's another thing you would want to do here. But let's get back to this point. So if you're going to do these installs and you change a tool and add it here, think about that apt-get update. That apt-get update downloads a cache of all of the metadata about all these packages. And then you're going to install these packages later. And if this second line here gets busted by changing, it's going to rerun, but it's going to be running based on that old cache of your apt get update. Ah, so you over time will start to experience problems because your packages will always be installing those old versions. A much better way to do this is to take all your apt get stuff, right? And that's not necessarily related to downloading this package here. This is a custom package. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but when it comes to these lines right here, this line's gonna have no effect on size because this line has to run in the same line as this one or it's not gonna work. Now, this is all maybe not true if you have another, okay. So you're not doing multi-stage. One way to get away with the size problem is to do multi-stage, but you're not doing multi-stage and that's okay. You don't have to do multi-stage. Um, so let's see. So what's going to happen here is that you would, I recommend taking these right here, taking all this right here, bumping it all up to this line. I would take this export line and put it above. So I would, I would just put it up here. So that way it's set and it never needs to change. And you don't have to worry about it in the middle of all your app to get stuff, right? And in general, it's it's good that you're having all your apt-get stuff near the top because uh, you want those dependencies, which usually take a long time to install, you want them to be high up as possible so you don't have to rerun them very often. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna recommend that you take all this stuff right here and put it up here. Now you can do this next because this is a manual package download and uh, install. So, when you do this, um, there's a couple of things you can do. One is this, this line right here is going to be a layer, and that layer is always going to include the dev file, even if you don't need it. So when you clean up later, it's not cleaning up these previous layers. That's one of the problems here, is that a, a, a file that's downloaded into a layer, and then you go to the next line, which is a or the next Docker command, I should say. The next Docker command will be a new layer. Think of that as a separate, uh, it's, it's up, once you've stopped a line or a, a Docker command, you cannot change that. You can't go back in time and change that. So the next line or the next command in Dockerfile will just add stuff to it. Now, if it deletes files, it's just gonna delete them in that layer. It'll essentially put some metadata in that says, hey, that file should no longer exist or look like it exists but those files are still gonna exist in those read-only layers because every layer above it is now read-only. And that's the way that these layers guarantee that they're identical to what you expect. So no layer can go back in time. So the, that's what you need to do is go check out some of the Docker default 
um, images. And so uh, let's do, let's actually go look at one of mine because it'll be a little more. it might be a little uh, easier to understand. So, uh, let's look at this one. Yeah, I'm not sure, okay, so Docker file. Yes, yeah, so there's, um, that's APK. But you'll notice here how it's all in one line. That's kind of a bad example. But let's do a hub and let's go look at Ghost. So um, look at this Debian Docker file. All right, here we go. So you'll notice that in this situation, it's downloading some stuff, it's dealing with that stuff, and then it's getting rid of that stuff all in one run line. So uh, that way, those files never stick around once that layer is sealed and marked read-only. And that's pretty key to keeping your images small. I bet once you make this stuff efficient uh, and combine this stuff together, that you'll you'll be saving hundreds of megs in your image size, right? And uh, the other thing here on this one is I would also add that to one single line. And another thing I would do there is you maybe don't need wget. You maybe can do an add. An add will automatically download a file from the internet. And if you're ever curious about the difference between copy and add, Really, nowadays, our standard is copy is really only for copying files out of the repo that you're in, right? So it just copies files in. Add does the same thing, but we tend to only want to use add when we're either downloading something from the internet or whatever we're copying in, we want it to unzip or untar. And uh, that that's really the only two reasons to use add. But the nice benefit of using add there is you wouldn't need to do w, wget. You could use uh, basically, Docker's internals will go get that file and download it. The negative of that, though, is that when you do that line and then you go to the next line, that package will still exist. So even though add's really cool there, in your case, because you're downloading a package that you're then going to install and then you don't need that package in the, anymore, I would maybe just put all three of those lines into one line that way at the very end you can actually delete that .deb file and save additional space in your final image so you would do all of that in one run all right hopefully that helps so looks like you're copying in some other files great that you're using copy not add um, you're also doing some make -ders and copying in certificates that's exactly how I would do it um, you might uh, to make this more optimized you might put um, all of these into a single run command, usually because the basically it's a little bit faster to build. It'll give you maybe a second faster in your build because every single one of these lines, it has to stop the container, create a new container, mount the rest of the image in, run that command, then save that to a new container image, and then start a new container, right? So it's got to do a lot more work than just run three quick commands. Um, so I might just have those in one. There's no space savings or anything there, but it's just a matter of uh, three commands really would turn into one long shell command there. And um, yeah, all right. Yep, we got the gits. I would probably do the same thing, uh, make those one uh, just for efficiency. Uh, by the way, so right here, you're copying in two different copy lines. You can make that one line. You could actually say copy and then the path to the CRT and then the path to that got the dot key e k k e y and have those two files and then put in the um, path to the SSL directory. So as long as they're both going to the same directory, you can have multiple files in the co single copy line. That'll help you um, make it a little easier. Uh, few, fewer lines is, tends to be better as long as they're not too complicated. Um, yep, you've got some standard uh, Apache stuff there on configurations. You might also uh, I don't know how much. Yeah, these are these are actually yeah these are good. I think those are good. Um, yep, doing some more copying of config files in. Some of these uh, you also might consider that these are standard config files, but if you need to overwrite these and you're using an orchestrator, whether you're using Kubernetes or Swarm, realize that you can use the config or in Kubernetes it's called config map. You can use the config feature in Swarm to mount these files in at runtime, so that way you're not hard coding any configurations. 
Ideally, you're not hard coding SSLs into your image either. Really, if, you're, if you have custom SSLs, you wanna store that in your orchestrator or in Docker and mount those in when you run because ideally there shouldn't be anything secret in an image when you save it. So um, hopefully you're gonna be doing that. The same thing here is you could combine these two uh, into one line. Uh, you could combine some of these into one line. You could probably, um, you know, if this is all the XML files in that directory, you could copy the directory asterisk.xml, and then you could copy all four into there. There's pros and cons to that, because then if an ex extra XML file shows up, it might accidentally get copied in. But uh, it just depends on how verbose you want to be and how uh, whether you want literal line for lines kind of stuff versus um, keeping the Docker file small and simple. All right, and then you got another copy run, you're changing the working directory, and then you got your entry point. Now, typically, uh, so you don't have a CMD. So my guess is you are using the CMD from this root image. And that's totally fine. Uh, there's nothing real wrong with that. One of the challenges I have with that though, is that people who are using my images, if I have a team of people, they won't know how to go get the CMD. So I tend to just repeat the CMD, even though it's unnecessary down here at the bottom, because they're going to get this inside of a repo and they're going to look at it. And if they're not super savvy on Docker, they're not going to realize, oh, I need to go find the Docker file for the from that it's coming from or use the history and go back and look at the history in time to find that CMD. So um, you could even maybe throw it in as just a comment to help people that are maybe looking at this Docker file. But I tend to find that because the entry point and the CMD are just so important to what does this Docker d image do, uh, that I tend to add those in even though it might be repetitive to a previous image. Again, all that's just metadata, so it doesn't really add any real time or bloat to your build um, rather than the other file changes and the run commands you do. But other than that, it looks like a great, uh, nice quality production Docker file that you have spent a lot of time on. But I think definitely overall, you could combine a lot of those apt get stuff to save a lot of space in your image and a lot of bloat and also avoid the update issue of having an old update that uh, basically an old app to get cache when you try to install new stuff. I would recommend you version these and you can basically inside this install command, you can specify the version of each. Uh, maybe some of these tools, it doesn't really matter, but when you start getting down to libraries that you need for, a for Apache, for your actual app, uh, these are just some more utilities for managing it, not really stuff that you would use on a production running app, right? But this lib Apache down here, I would definitely version that. I have been bit by this bug in PHP because uh, a MongoDB driver in PHP changed versions inside of my image and it broke, it had a bug and it broke my production apps because I didn't pin it in the Docker file. And I basically went to production. I just, one day I, I rebuilt the image. It went, it worked fine on my machine because my machine had a different version because there's no, since there's no versions there, you're basically getting whatever the newest version is when you built the image. So it's kind of a random hope that you get a good version that works. So you definitely want to pin that one. Uh, I personally would pin them all and uh, just you know update them once a month or something or whatever your security team requires. But that's a great Docker file. Thank you so much. Um, of course, there's always room for improvement and I'm, I'm glad you showed up to help with that. Thanks for watching. Click the subscribe and the notification bell down there will let you know when I go live every week to take your questions on Docker and DevOps. You can watch these videos over here or you can just go watch those cat videos you've been meaning to watch.